Good morning, Blackwell. Good morning. Oh, that sounds good. Welcome inside of this beautiful sanctuary this morning. Isn't it beautiful? Doesn't it look like Christmas? Hallelujah, the birthday of our King. We welcome those that are from our streaming audience, as well as those that are in our parking lot, and of course those that are sitting here this morning enjoying our, our friendship and our family of God. We're going to start by singing, thank you, <laughs> oh come, oh come Emmanuel, please rise as we sing. Good morning again to everyone, and uh, I don't know about you all, I had a good Thanksgiving. Did everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Amen. It was really good. It's always good to be with family, and uh, uh, especially with not only my immediate family, but also part of the church family, and I thank them very much for coming and being uh, a special part of it. For those of you who have your bulletin, if you will notice the things that we have, especially this coming Wednesday, we have church conference. So I would like for, it would be awesome if everyone was here for church conference so we can hear about what goes on here at Blackwell. What is the Lord leading, the direction? Uh, we, you know, the, one of the things that we sometimes struggle with as members is wondering why we don't know things that are going on. We don't, we don't understand what, what happened. Why don't I know? Well, we're going to try to make more of an effort to make sure that things like that are known during our church conference during these times. So we'd like you, if you can, and I do understand for those of you who do not, are not able to drive in the dark, I do understand that and those who might not be um, an, a help. So anyway, we would love to have you 6.30 Wednesday evening. This morning, it is exciting as we're going to remember the death and resurrection of our Lord through the communion special time we also want to make sure that the service itself is a time of where we can put aside anything that's distracting us anything that is causing our mind to waver we want to make sure that we can focus on our worship what it is that we can how we can serve the Lord this morning in our worship, giving of ourselves. So let's remember that this morning as we, as we go through the service, that this is our time. You have encouraged me. Thank you for coming. I see every one of you, and uh, I'm, I'm so glad to see you, and thank you for encouraging me, and I hope that each one is encouraging each other. Okay, so this morning as we move forward, I want to also share one other thing. Um, don't forget to look at the, um, the toiletries for the Scott House on the, in the bulletin as well as the Heritage Care Christmas list. Is there anything uh, that I need to know about either one of those that we have enough of that we do not need? Any items? The last, I think last Sunday there was something we didn't need that was mentioned to me. Anybody remember? Lotion. lotion? Okay, so we don't, do not need the lotions, but look at... Right. Okay, for the Scott House, okay? Also, before we do the prayer, there you go, Brother Steve. I can't believe I remember, brother. <laughs> uh, Honesty. Just, just one quick thing. Uh, several weeks ago, we had a special guest that spoke during our Sunday school hour. And that morning, we didn't take up a love offering. And right after uh, she spoke, Several people came up to me, and they wanted to, uh, to give a donation to us. And I've even had people come up to me since then. 
So uh, I'm referring to Melanie. And if you would like to give a donation, we'll have it open today and again next Sunday. Just uh, make the check out to Blackwell and put her name on the, on the memo line. And we'll, we'll get it to her. Thank you. All right, and to reemphasize what he was saying, make the check available with you in the memo line. Remember to put Melanie's name on there so we can make sure that the money is applied to the, the right place, okay? So right now, let's ask the Lord to lead us in this service. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us with another breath, another day, Lord, to glorify you. Lord, there are people that you put in our path, Lord. I, I ask you, Lord, for us to be more, uh, to help us be more aware of what your will is for our life, who it is that we are to share with, who it is that we are to witness to, or to, Lord, just to uh, show that we love them, that we care for them, Lord. Lord, this morning, as we move into this service, Lord, we want to glorify you in our singing, in our concentration on our worship, Lord, in reverence. Remembering, Lord, the, that you're the, the great giver, the giver of your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, Lord, and arose on that third day. What an awesome gift, Lord, and we are so thankful. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is Angels from the Realms of Glory. Please rise as we sing. As we, as we move into the service, let's remember, as part of giving of ourselves this morning, we are going to give of our tithes and offerings, and we are to do so with a cheerful heart. Thank you. You may be seated.
Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us and the opportunity that we have to gather together to praise you, to worship you. And we thank you for all these many gifts, all the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us, that you are always giving us constantly. And we thank you for this season that is rapidly approaching. We thank you for the decorations, all the preparations that are being made. We thank you for the music. But most of all, we thank you for the real meaning, the true meaning of this season, the gift of your son. Please help keep us mindful of that and keep, help us be mindful of the ones who are, not, who are not as fortunate as we are. Please now take these gifts and use them to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, choir. Let us break bread together. I like that song. I love it. Thanksgiving. Again, we mentioned that this month of November, though we should be thankful all the time, we at least made November our Thanksgiving month. So we're going to um, be thank thankful and messages and Bible studies on being thankful. So that was our our goal, and I think we're about to accomplish that, fully accomplish that goal. So before we start, if you want to put uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 8 on the screen to start off with, or 6, what I gave you, we're going to read the first two verses. But before we start, you know, I remember growing up, Thanksgiving, I remember the hustle and bustle of it, or I remember, um, you know, the kids, there was four of us, so obviously my mom, uh, she really worked hard, um, my goodness did she work hard, um, we were all over the place, and we were antsy, and we had to be doing this, and had to be doing that, we were always being uh, called down, and, um, you know, told to behave, and uh, it reminded me of this story that I want to share with you this morning. All right. Two little girls one day were acting very badly. They were misbehaving. It was on Thanksgiving Day, and their father got very upset, and he said, Girls, go to your room. You are dismissed from the Thanksgiving dinner. The girls went dejected and sad to their rooms. 
A few moments later, they heard their mother calling, Girls, girls, come down to dinner, girls. A little baffled in light of what their father had said, they sheepishly walked down to the dinner table and sat down. But they noticed something. Dad was not there. So they naturally asked mother, Mother, where is dad? Well, the mother said, Dad went to his room. But why, Mom? Because Dad loves you so much. He couldn't change his standard, but he didn't want to deny you dinner. So Dad said he would go and he would pay the price so that you could come and eat the meal. So while you enjoy the meal, remember that your dad has picked up the tab and is paying the penalty. Brothers and sisters here today, when you forget to say thanks for everything else, don't forget to say thanks for Jesus. Don't forget to say thanks for Jesus. Very interesting, as I've come across that, I started thinking about um, how close we came a couple of times from being dismissed from the table. And, you know, that's not a real good time to be dismissed. That was actual time where just like we did Thursday, where we went around the table, and I don't know how many did, did anybody talk about before they prayed the things that they were thankful for. We did. We went around the table, and we talked about the things that we were thankful for. Getting in a better practice, a better practice of recognizing God's work in our lives. Even those that are not saved, it doesn't mean that God has not provided you know, God loves us. He created us in his image. He desires the best of us. But most of all, he desires a relationship with us. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 8. There's, we're going to read this, but I want you to understand that there's really one verse that I'm going to concentrate on because we, when I read this, you're going to recognize it from a, you know, verses that I've read before. But it's kind of found in a strange context here. So we'll read from verse 6 and, the, and, and 7 and 8, and then we'll jump right to the verse that we want to consider or talk about this morning. Now, oh, does everybody have their Bibles? Everybody have their Bible? If you have a chance, do that now. 2 Corinthians 9, even though it's on the screen, good practice. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 through 8. Now this I say, he, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully each one must do just as he was has purposed in his heart not grudgingly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything you may have an abundance in every good deed. That's all I want to go to this morning so far. But I want to share with you that Paul, because he has a huge love for Christ and a devotion, obviously, to Christ, his attention very, very quickly shifts from the practicalities here of what it is to give monetarily to God, to his work, to the, uh, and then it goes, it shifts from there to the excitement that he, that he has in knowing Christ as his Lord and Savior. So let's go to chapter, I mean, uh, verse 15. Do we have verse 15? There you go. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. His indescribable gift. What is his indescribable gift? His indescribable gift of his son, Jesus. In an indescribable gift. Thanks be unto God for his undescribable, unspeakable gift. So first we see Paul the apostle. What he's doing here is he's instructing the believers in Corinth on the way they're giving to the work of God. He's, that's the way he starts out. How they should lay aside certain financial resources and give it to the church and why so that they might spread the gospel the purpose of his church 
On this occasion, as on any other occasion, the Apostle Paul, because he was a man that was so inspired, because he loved Christ so much and had a devotion to uh, Christ, his attention very, very swiftly changes from those practicalities of giving, as I was saying, uh, the, fin uh, the financial part of God's work. It shifts to the great thrill that he has in knowing, in knowing that God gave such an indescribable gift. The practicality, going from the practicality of the financial gifts to the greatest giver there has ever been, God Almighty. And then it was in order to bring our attention not only to the greatest giver, but the greatest gift that has ever been given, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. So what he's telling us about this gift is that God has given to us an infinite, transcendent, above all human gifts that ever been given. To, to be a follower of Christ, growing in Christ, growing in a relationship with Christ, is, it, is an, it is a relationship that should be growing in awe, in reverence. And we, we talked about what reverence means. Reverence meaning in an awe, an awe of a great God and all that he, not only what he does, but who he is. Now, this is characteristic of Paul as you read his letters. Sometimes, spontaneously, he'll just share almost out of tone to what he's already been saying. In other words, a great appreciation and ex uh, exclamation of the capacity he has in his heart. as well as his mind to love and devote himself to the Lord Jesus Christ. I think about the gifts, the thankfulness for the gifts, the thankfulness of we have in Christ and what we do as a result of that thankfulness of what Christ has done for us. He's talking to this church about giving resources to gospel ministry. Again, but then he says, thanks be unto God for the, his unspeakable gift. Some might say, well, it's very strange, is it not, that Paul should attempt to motivate our financial giving by recalling something as sacred as the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not. Because we find that he does this on other occasions as well. If you continue to read his other letters, as well as even in this particular letter to Corinth in chapter 8, and um, in verse 9, he is talking about how the Macedonians were so liberal in their giving to the work of the church. And he says to the believers there, Ye know the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that he through his poverty might be rich. He was rich in heaven. He had everything. And then he came to earth to be walking beside us. So Paul's exhorting the Corinthians by the example of the Macedonians. That's what he's doing. But the motivation he gives is that the Lord was one who was immeasurably rich in heaven. And then he came in human flesh and became poor so that he might be rich through his marvelous, matchless grace. Not long after writing this letter to the Corinthians, Paul uses the same motivation... And he says, he, God, who spread not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? This morning is to make aware of the great gift of God to us as we come upon the Christmas season, realizing that it is, is the time of the birth of Jesus. Being thankful that we have a God that is alive today, a God that is not in the grave. We can listen to other religions talk about their God, but their God is dead. What kind of God is that that is dead? But we don't have a God that's dead. We have a God that is alive, alive in me. I've had people ask me, how do you know this God is real? And I said, well, I have to. I have to start 
And I can say this with joy in my heart, that I know he's alive because he's in me. He's alive in me. I'm so excited to be up here today to just to be able to share this with you. Because what would we do without him? First of all, I think about, Lord, the needs that I have. Who would I go to? Who would I go to for my needs? Who would I be so excited to go through in prayer and say, Lord, you know my situation. You know my needs. But, Lord, I ask you in, in specific for this uh, specific, uh, specific gift or specific need. I need you to answer that prayer. Yes, a personal wish. But, look, but, but most of all, we want it to align with his will for our lives. I've shared time and time again that... It doesn't necessarily mean that gift will be, uh, that prayer will be answered, especially if you're praying for lottery, lottery tickets to be answered, right? An answer to your prayer. But we can see the things that God desires for us in his scriptures, that he, he wants to take care of our needs. He wants us to give us an, an abundant life, but the abundant life is in him. It's not separated from him. So as new Christians, as Everyone should know that how we find that out is in his word. We need to read his word. What does that mean, supplying my abundant life? Paul here is basically saying, can you Christians who have received so generously and have been treated so favorably by God, be anything else but generous to your fellow man? As a result of God's love for us, his immeasurable love for us, does it not create a desire to want to do? And we talked last Sunday about the work that we do creates even more thankfulness. So it, 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 it works together. It just proves to me as a follower of Christ that more proof that he's alive today as everything is tied together. His love for us and what he does for us and what we do for him, it just full, runs full circle because it shows, it, it reflects him in us. See, that's what we are as Christians. We're supposed to be at a reflection of Jesus Christ to this world. We are to be a light in this world. For many, and that might be a scary thing. So he said, freely you have received, freely give. But Paul's thought here is not only that we should give to others because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but the thought is also here that we should be filled as he was with the thankfulness when we consider the immensity of God's gift in his own son. When he's telling us that, it, what he's telling us is that this gift that God has given to us is transcendent, infinitely transcendent above all human gifts that we will ever, that are ever given. There's a, a hymn writer, he put it like this. He said, was ever a gift like the Savior given? No, not one, not one. So my question to you this morning as I share this message is a very personal question. I want to ask you, are you thankful as Paul was for the Lord Jesus? How thankful are you for God's gift? Does it reflect in your life? See, I think about words that we use so loosely. One is to say that I love. We love everything. I love my pet turtle. I love my dog. I love this. I love that. But to understand the love of God is to know that it goes deeper. It's a deeper love. And then there's giving. There's the gift of Christ. The desire to give. The, the reality of his gift to us. Do we recognize? Do, are we willing to receive what it really means that he gave his life for us? That his purpose was to save us from that very thing that was condemning us, that was taking us to a hell. Sin is not liked by God. He does not desire that. He turns his head from sin. It, it 
takes our relationship. It severs our relationship. It causes us to have a relationship that is no longer intact until we return to him in repentance. I don't want a broken, a broken, excuse me. I don't want a broken relationship with Christ. I need to be in tune with him. This world is so easy to be what a person wants to follow, what a person wants to be part of. It's become routine in our lives as we leave the house and become part of our work environment or whatever it is that, that you do. It surrounds us. It becomes who we are if we're not careful. So you can't be thankful for something or someone if you don't appreciate them. And so the question could very well be the same similar thing. Do you appreciate Christ? What is your appreciation of him? So let me say this. We could talk a lot on that theme this morning from the Word of God relating to the soul's eternal destination. But I don't think there's a more important question in the whole of this world, whether it is this religious world or just every day in our everyday lives. It is a question that Christ asked the religious Pharisees in his own day. What do you think of Christ? Are you thinking about Christ? So what do you think about him? You see, that is the question that determines the great spiritual divide in our world today in the eyes of God. The divide in humanity that God sees is not the same thing that man sees. It's not black and white. It's not between classes of rich and poor. It's not the differences of denominations or of political nature. It's not even the division between Muslim, Christian, and Jew. The division that God sees in our world is between two types of people, right? Saved and unsaved people. And it is determined upon their estimation of what of his beloved son and how they have allowed the estimation and appreciation to affect their lives. How do we let it affect our life and our internal eternal destination. That was the division in the day of Christ when he walked upon the earth, and that is the same division and the only division, can I say, that God sees our world. See, when the Lord Jesus was among men, it says in John 7 that there was a division among the people because of him. How true is that of our own day? There's still a division today among the people because of Christ and their esteem or their lack of it concerning him. But what we see here in Paul's words is that in appreciation, the fact that he appreciated Christ so much and was so thankful and that he described the Savior as God's unspeakable gift I want to share with you that word unspeakable in the original Greek language that the New Testament is written cannot be found anywhere else in the whole Bible. It actually means this is something that cannot be related. It's a similar word that even Peter, Peter used when he talked about the experience that those who trust in Christ have. Thanks be unto God for his gift, precious beyond telling, his indescribable, inexpressible free gift. So let me share something with you this morning, why Paul thought Jesus as an unspeakable gift and why. His birth, as we look at the New Testament, was indescribable. When we look at Luke's gospel, chapter 1 and the verses uh, 34 and 35, how will this be since I am a virgin, Mary said. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason also the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. Now let me share with you in just a second the King James Version. There's something unique that we're getting ready to read in the King James. He said, 
the angel said, that holy thing, that holy thing. A strange description of the Savior, but how can you describe the indescribable? How can you describe it? The first ever being in which the two worlds were blended of both heaven and earth. The man who was very man, yet very God, as his only begotten son. The angel couldn't even describe this. Couldn't describe or grasp what was the reality. That virgin birth was indescribable. We read in Timothy's version, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. See, this is a mystery. It is indescribable. It is unspeakable to imagine how God could become a man. God could take human flesh. But this is the message that Paul that Paul is so excited about. Thanks be unto God for the gift of giving to man his son as a man in human flesh. Are you thankful? Does this not kind of blow your mind? The gift that God has given to humankind. It is the greatest gift that has ever been given. I believe it is also the greatest miracle that God has ever performed. And that was the incarnation of his own son. So do you believe this morning in that describable gift? One of the things that, uh, that amazes me is that God not only died for those who were during that time or you know, earlier history, but he also died for us before we were ever in existence. He knew ahead of time that we were going to fail. And I, I thank him for doing that. I thank God for give, having patience in me. 55 years old. I know that's not old to some of you, but I, I, I feel it. Especially if I go down those steps. But knowing that he had patience with me, it hurts me to believe that all of these years that I've disappointed him, that maybe, you know, God has called, he spoke to me, and he shared with me, and I did not listen. I didn't slow down, and I just continued to do my own thing and think that as long as I believed, I was okay. Until I started getting into Bible study and really getting into the depths of Bible study and understanding what it really means to be in a relationship with Christ. That it was more than just to believe. It was to follow. We know as the Bible says, if you cannot pick up your cross and follow him, you cannot be his disciple. Picking up, in your, picking up your cross and following him is an action. It's something we have to do. This morning, is, it's time now as we're going to have this invitation before we are in communion. If this morning, we had a couple of people that have given their life to Christ already this morning. It's been an awesome morning. And I think that somebody here, if you're doubting, if you're questioning, you need to know that you need to be sure. You're probably not saved. That you need to be sure this morning by saying, I need Jesus. Think about your life. Does your life today represent, is your life actions today represent a life that reflects Jesus? Good way of finding out, really, if you're saved or not. Do you have a desire? Do you have the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you feel him guiding you and you're just not listening or you just don't feel this morning is your opportunity to give your life to Christ. It's to profess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. It is not hard. It's just something he desires to have a relationship with those that he's created. 
He said, I loved you so much that I'm giving you a choice. So to all those that say, why would a great God send us to hell? The answer to that is, Jesus gave you a choice. He said, either you can love me or not. Whichever you choose is where you choose for your eternity. So by not loving him is saying that I choose to spend eternity without Jesus. But because I love him, I get to spend it forever with him. What will be your choice today as we sing, I hark the herald, angels sing. Okay, let's stand and sing before we do communion. I'm going to give that opportunity for you to come forward. If you need to put something to the altar, bring it to the altar. Whatever it is, come today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I thank you this morning for the scriptures that we read, for the word that you've given us. I thank you, Lord, for your son. I thank you for what he did on that cross. Lord, I think about his outstretched arms on that cross telling us that he loves us that much. Lord, I pray, Lord, that myself will recognize that great gift all year long, Lord, as I continue to seek the cross moving forward. Lord, as we go through the rest of this service, Lord, now we come upon the time of communion, remembering you. Lord, I pray. Lord, that we glorify you in this communion. And we appreciate everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen. If the deacons want to come down, they can. <clears throat>
This morning, as in all communions, God desires all of his followers to take part in this supper. As Paul says, we are in danger of judgment by not doing so. So for those who do not know or are not aware, communion is for those who have professed Jesus as their Savior and been baptized. The birth, the Bible, excuse me, reminds us, sorry about that, Christians that we are free to take communion in humility. It's important. As we are born again and living in obedience to God with no unresolved sins. One example for taking communion in an unworthy manner means to do so while you have a problem with another Christian with whom you are not reconciled. Another is we may have agendas other than what the supper is for. Listen, to move forward in such a reverent sacrament and have negative issues with, a, with others or are living in sin without caring for God's will or his desire for you and no desire for reconciliation is blasphemy. This is so important, and I am not taking for granted, of course, that everyone knows these things before we go forward. God desires humility, no matter what we are going through. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine 29 says, For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment on themselves, if he does not judge the body, the body rightly. This morning, God wants your heart as we are here together, just as the disciples were, attentive, listening to every word from Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that hearts are clear. Lord, I pray that if there is anything in any heart here this morning, that we would rid that from our hearts, Lord, and focus on you, whether it's asking for repentance, whatever it is, Lord, but clear our hearts, Lord, so that you are the focal point. You are who we are glorifying. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, gave thanks took bread and broke it and said, this is my body.
this bread that you're holding in your hand? Jesus said, this is his body, broken for you. Eat ye all of it. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time right now, Lord, as we give of our selves in communion. We thank you for this covenant that you've given us in, in your blood. We, Lord, we pray that this will be something that we hide in our hearts, Lord, as we leave here, understanding the love that we are to give to you and the love that we are to give to others. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. The new covenant in his blood. Drink ye all of it. For as often as you eat, 
this bread and drink this cup. Do so as often as you proclaim until you proclaim the Lord's death. Thank you all for being part of this service this morning and worship. We thank you for those that are uh, still joining us maybe on uh, Facebook. Those in the parking lot, we appreciate all of you. We pray that as you leave here that everyone gets home safely and is back, back, back at, your next, at our next appointed time. Okay? So it's good to see you all. If you would, let's stand and join hands as we sing, Bless Be the Tide, please. Thank you.